Some days, politics has the ability to astonish us. We had one of those days recently when a 19-year-old Brock University student stunned the Ontario PC Party establishment. Sam Oosterhoff captured the PC nomination for the by-election to replace former party leader Tim Hudak, defeating the current PC Party president and a well-known regional councillor in the process. What kind of impact might this have on the party's game plan for the 2018 general election, now 19 months away? Let's ask. John Capobianco, senior partner at Fleischmann Hillard, Adrian Batra, editor-in-chief of the Toronto Sun, and Martin Redcon, Ontario politics columnist for the Toronto Star. Good to have everybody back around our little table here. here. Let's start. You don't mind if I quote him, do you? No, of course <laughs> not. <okay. laughs> We're all friends. Here's Martin in the Toronto Star from the 29th of October. For public consumption, the temptation is to celebrate local democracy in action. Predictably and reflexively, PC leader Patrick Brown hailed the unexpected triumph of Sam Oosterhoff, likely to be his newest MPP, as a breath of fresh air, a new voice for youth, and a reward for hard work. In public. Privately, however, his upset victory has upset many in the party who know better than to embrace a darling of social conservatives at the very time Brown is belatedly trying to distance himself from fringe politics. Martin, question, how much damage do you think Sam Oosterhoff's victory in the nomination, not yet the by-election, but in the nomination, does to Patrick Brown's plans for the PC party? That's a very difficult question. It creates risk that the Liberals will do what Stephen Harper did to Michael Ignatieff and Stefan Dion, that they will try to frame him, that has an unfortunate double on Toronto, try to box him in mm -hmm. as being a super social conservative. I don't know whether Patrick Brown in his heart of hearts is a social conservative. His voting record, undeniably, was social conservative. Campaign Life Coalition gave him a green whatever medal or of honor. This is as, when he was an MP in Ottawa. As an MP in Ottawa, as a backbencher, for the way he voted on abortion issues and, and same-sex marriage. But I don't know how this will play out a year and a half from now, because without preempting our discussion, I want to just throw out there that there's not much damage that a social conservative can do now to, to affect provincial law. The sex ed uh, uh, update of our curriculum after all these years of debate, which we can talk about later, is now the curriculum. And Patrick Brown has clarified that unlike his letter where he said he would scrap it, he's now not going to scrap it. So that's done. Abortion is not really handled at the provincial level, so that's not really on the table. So all we're talking about here is credibility and character issues, and I don't know how much of an impact that will have at election time. Adrian, how about you on that? Well, I think what uh, Martin, I agree with what, much of what Martin has said. I don't think that uh, Patrick Brown wants to be defined as that social conservative, because campaigning is one thing in a leadership and to say certain things to various groups is is one thing but when you come to when it times to govern you have to be the premier for all of ontario and you have to represent downtown toronto like you are going to represent sudbury or a smaller town with mr oosterhoff i think it's actually a, quite a fascinating thing what happened the, rick dykstra didn't get his vote out and we he's know the, he's the president of the party yeah and he was going to go get, go for that nomination mm -hmm. And when it's it's competitive and it's contested, you have to get your vote out. This young guy did. He took time off school. He campaigned. He hit. He pounded the pavement. Yes, he's got that socially conservative bent. But as Martin already mentioned, there's very few things, very little things that um, the, where the provincial government can can touch that. So I know the Liberals will want to scare Ontarians in the 2018 election and say, if you do this, some, somehow all of the your rights are going to be taken away. So Patrick Brown has to be very careful to pivot away from that and recognize. That that yes, there is a wing of his party that still is, is very vocal, but if he can handle it the way uh, I think Prime Minister Stephen Harper handled part of that uh, wing of his party, he can be very successful in making, make, keeping the agenda on the economy. You've got to explain to me, as a party insider and a guy who understands how these things happen, how a 19-year-old Brock University student defeats the president of the party, who is a former MP, the second vice president of the party, who is a regional councillor in that area, both of whom have way more political experience and presumably, you know, resources to bring to bear than the guy who eventually won. How did that happen? Well, I exactly, Stephen. And I got to tell you, I give him full credit and congratulations to Sam because, you know, when I ran for the nomin I ran for a nomination twice and uh, <clears throat> I thought at 30 I was old. So at 19, <laughs> I give him a lot of credit. But, um, but again, in my second nomination, I actually ran against Morley Kells. 
So I was a young guy going against a former cabinet minister in my mm -hmm. running with Tobago Lakeshore. So it is about the numbers. It's about getting out the vote. It doesn't matter how many uh, people, mem your memberships you actually um, recruit at the end of the day. It's actually getting them out. And I think in this particular riding, there was four people. So there was a lot of machinations that were going on with respect to the first, second, and third ballot because it was preferential balloting. Mm -hmm. And I think Tony Quirk, who was one of the, uh, for, for sort of a Niagara City Councillor who was one of the candidates running, uh, admitted in one of the papers that he tried to cut a deal with Sam to say whoever finished second, thinking that Tony would finish second, would sort of, you know, take the other person's votes. And, of course, Sam finished uh, <laughs> second, and all of Tony's votes went to, uh, went to him. Surprise, surprise. Because he only lost about 100, Rick only lost about 100 votes. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of that mass issues that happened. But I, I think the key thing here is that Patrick has always said that, and he's to this day living it, that he will be open and accessible to whoever wants to run. He's not going to get engaged. Mm -hmm. We've seen that in a number of nominations where people have run, and some have said to him, Patrick, you can't have this person running. And he said, you know what, I'm going to let whoever run, wants to run, run, as long as whoever wins abides by the party's principles and by the party's constitution mm -hmm. and supports the party's policies. If he is, though, trying to put forward the face of a party that is more moderate and therefore can attract, let's say, disaffected liberals in the 2018 election, is it problematic for Patrick Brown that the social conservatives now feel that they are very much in the driver's seat in this party? Well, Patrick's always said, and of course I still believe, that social conservatives are more than welcome in our party. It's a big tent party. Mm -hmm. I think unlike the federal, uh, federal liberals, I think Justin Trudeau, before the last election, basically made an edict to say nobody that believes uh, in abortion is, can never run as a candidate. Now, that's his prerogative as leader of the party. Patrick believes that anybody who wants to run, as no, long as said, they... Sorry, but let me make sure. Trudeau said you have to be pro... Choice. Pro choice. Pro choice. Whoever, right. whoever believes you got to be pro choice to run for the Liberal Correct. Party last federal election. Right. So, but he made that kind of unique. That's his prerogative. Patrick is the opposite. He's saying whoever wants to run, as long as they abide by the party principles and policies, they can. And you know, like Patrick, who was started when his leadership race started at fourth place, he worked hard and became, you know, ran and, and won and became the leader. Mm -hmm. He likes to see people who are the underdogs get in there, run and win because they're going to be scrappers. They're going to be the ones who are going to fight in the election. The can, social conservatives don't work. Jump in on that, yeah, sure. That point, just to your question, which mm -hmm. John slightly dodged with goodwill, with goodwill. <laughs> uh, so he didn't just win with hard work, and he didn't just win by cutting classes at, at Brock in his first few weeks at, at Brock. He won by reaching out to his church and to his parishioners. And there are thousands of church members in that riding. And there was a, 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 nothing wrong with this, but let's be, let's be candid. There was a concerted effort to reach out, partly uh, driven by Campaign Life Coalition, to bring out the pro-life, uh, sorry, the pro, yes, yes pro-life, pro get mixed up here, the pro-life uh, anti-abortion vote. So he didn't, it wasn't just a matter of bringing in more party members, it was about signing up members. Now that's how the rules work. And I don't think it's a great idea when any special interest group hijacks uh, a party nomination, whether it's conservatives. The liberals have had problems with this before. Mm -hmm. Tom Wapel won on a pro-life um, juggernaut in Scarborough years ago. I well remember that. And he was a single-minded pro-life candidate. So let's, let's describe what's at play here. It isn't just hustle. It's determination, motivation by a particular special interest. But I think Can any I special interest, regardless mm -hmm. if it's liberal or conservative or NDP, special interests always get involved um, at, the, at the party nomination process, for better or worse. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a good thing, but let's not pretend that it's just conservatives that have this issue with, with, with the socially conservative wing. I mean, the liberals have had it with various, uh, you know, social programs and, and things that have been pushed from, the, from the left. New Democrats New with Democrats unions. New Democrats the same. Yeah. It's, so yeah, it, sure. it happens on yeah. all sides. I, I just say, and I think, too, too, Martin, I think you're right as far as any sort of one interest group hijacking a, a nomination. I think the nomination process is such that it is a one member, one vote. So anybody can sign up, and it is that part of the process. Process. But if you look at Sam's first ballot support, so if you're saying that the pro-lifers uh, came out and supported him uh, exclusively, and they might have, he, he wouldn't have won on the first ballot. In fact, because it was a, a preferential balloting system, and because a lot of Tony Quirk's second ballot support went to uh, Sam, that put him over the top, or else, in, in of itself, so those votes he, alone wouldn't have probably won. He, Rick would have won. Just so I'm clear, so he had to appeal to just more than the social conservatives to yes, win, yes, is your point? Yes, 100%. Yep. Okay, but 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 you know, preferential ballot. It's just a runoff. So he had he he won the room, and and I think the room was dominated by them. The other part of the of the question, I think, to Steve's original question, is I think Rick Dykstra ran a lousy campaign, yes. and that tells yes, us something exactly. interesting about where the Progressive Conservative Party is at. I don't want to be alarmist, 
I don't think Patrick Brown's a pushover when it comes to organization. We all accept that he is an insurgent in his own right, uh, in the best sense. But if, if the party president can't win against a 19-year-old in Niagara, where Rick is almost from, then what does that say about his ability to take on the leader? I actually machine? don't think that that is reflective of the leader and the leader and the, and the party apparatus in of itself. I think that was indicative of simply just that individual candidate. He perhaps took things for granted, which so often they do, because he's got the name. Well, let's he's, keep in he's mind, well known. He, he wasn't running in his home riding either. No, he was of running one not. over where they yeah. presumably knew him right. not as well. And, and, and also the fact that he signed up a lot of members. So Rick, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that factored into to that win for Sam and, and the loss for Rick. But, uh, you know, I think I think the fact that, that there was over a thousand plus members that were signed up in Niagara, I think that there was that excitement. I think the fact that yeah. Sam's getting so much press is actually positive, notwithstanding the fact that some will say that because he's a social conservative. But Patrick's already said that he embraces uh, Sam as a candidate, as he would, mm -hmm. and he's also said that he will abide by the party's principles and policies as any candidate should. Because Sam if has said that. Uh, Sam has said that, and yeah. Patrick has said that on his behalf as well. Mm -hmm. But I think anybody who decides to run for a party's nomination, as I have and as others have, they have to sign on to the fact that once, if they win, they have to believe in the party's policy. They can debate it in caucus, they can you know, discuss issues, but once caucus and once the party decides on policy and a platform, you're, you're with it, or you're citizen independent. So the leader has decided that the progressive conservative <coughs> Conservative Party of Ontario today stands for marriage equality. Sam Oosterhoff stands for marriage equality? Well, but, but he, he personally may stand against it, but the party stands in favor of it, and I believe that Sam is going to be in favor of that because Patrick's already made it clear with respect, with respect to sex education that he's not going to change it, that he endorses it. He's already been clear with he's not going to bring up the whole abortion debate at all, and not, to Martin's point, you can't. So I think from that perspective, social issues are not going to be Patrick's number one priority. It's going to be hydro rates and the economy. In the economy. The overarching question, though, is how does a leader, and we've seen Stephen Harper, as you pointed out, have have to deal with this. We saw 20 years ago, Mike Harris have to deal with this. How does a leader of, and this is pretty much, I think, a uniquely conservative phenomenon, mm -hmm. make social conservatives feel that they have a place inside that big tent that John talked about, while at the same time projecting the notion to the broader Ontario community that you're not captive mm -hmm. of this one interest group, that in fact, you do have the bigger picture in mind. That is such a tightrope to walk. How do you do that? Well, and, and Reagan did it in the United States. Yes, he you did. Know, so it, it is, it is, yeah, and, and of yeah. course, it is a challenge. There's no question about that because if anything, conservatives have demonstrated over the last 10 years all across this country at a provincial level is once that socially conservative wing sort of overtakes the narrative of a campaign, you lose. We've saw that in, in Alberta. We've seen mm -hmm. it in other places as well. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. I think, I think to John's larger point, about what this next election is going to be fought on. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fought on hydro weights. It's going to be fought on those dollars and cents issues that are mattering to the average Ontarian. All of this other stuff, Steve, does not matter to them right now. And so if Patrick is able to, to explain and, and convince his caucus members that, look, I know we're gonna have these battles. I know where your mindset's at. I know you wanna re-look uh, at the, the sex ed curriculum. I've said we'll publicly consult, but but let's, let's have the ability at the get-go to cause change so we've got to win this election first. The problem with that is, is that the, if so social conservatives don't feel they have a voice inside the progressive conservative party, then they support it, the family coalition well, party they do, and, and then, they deprive the PCs of all those votes that they otherwise might get. And then they leak stories to the Toronto Sun Precisely. and the Toronto Star and to, to try to undermine the leader. That's the type I, I think I think what you're going to see in this next camp, in the next year, I think you're going to see a lot more tightening of the message coming out of the, the leader's office and, and a far uh, far fewer leaks and you're going to see a lot more people on board than, than you can, you, you'd be in the past. Can I just say that if you had told me about a year or two ago that we would be discussing tonight the idea of a SOCON candidate, sex education updates and pro-life, I would have thought you're crazy. So the point is this keeps coming back despite Patrick Brown's best efforts and some of his mistakes, mm -hmm. writing that letter under his signature and then renouncing it a, a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. So, so it is, a, it is a, a, a very difficult balancing act for him. Look, in the U.S., it's a winning issue. And so you see people like Mitt Romney and Donald Trump changing their position and George Bush Sr. changing and previously pro-life politicians becoming uh, sorry, pro-choice becoming pro-life in order to secure the Republican nomination. In Canada, it's a losing issue, you're right. And Patrick Brown has, has played with fire over the years. Stephen Harper understood that mm -hmm. and tried to keep abortion off the agenda. What did Patrick Brown do as a backbencher? He voted against Stephen Harper's advice, and I think even Jason Kenney's mm -hmm. advice, 
and voted to explore the question of late-term abortions in Canada, which Harper wanted off the agenda. But I, but I think, though, I think, Martin, quite frankly, I'm not sure anybody wants to ever stifle that debate. That's a legitimate debate that people that believe in those issues and those causes ought to and should bring them up. And I think it's not up to the leader to stifle those, quite frankly, but embrace them, but deal with them as a leader, as a leader can only, and should. My only point is that Stephen Harper did try to push it aside, and Patrick Brown went forward with right. it. But and Stephen I, Harper I, allowed I his backbenchers to have those free votes, right? Yes. I mean, he did, they brought motions uh, forward, and, and many, always. and, and le, uh, well, some, on, on, some, on this issue, yeah. they, mm. they brought, you know, yeah. private members bill forward. Mm. They could vote on it. Some liberals actually voted with conservatives on it. But yeah, I mean, I think Harper did a far better job than, but what we may have seen you know, well, from, and I think, it, I think the jury's still out on Patrick, quite frankly, and I think that there's people in his current caucus right now that are social conservatives and that he's been able to deal with over the course of the last year and a half that he's been the leader. So I do think, Martin, that some, some will have those private views, and they should, but I think it's up to the leader to determine how best to handle those, and also the party, quite frankly. And I think that, you know, with respect to votes, I think that uh, social conservatives will always have strong votes, and they'll always vote for the conservatives in some cases, mm -hmm. but I think it's up to Patrick to broaden his base beyond you know, to include social conservatives, to make those that are disenfranchised or upset at the Liberals over the last 10 to 15 years of government come and vote, because those are the That's people right. that he needs to use do to win. Do you know, though, do, do you know, John, <coughs> in his heart of hearts, put it this way, I, I, I can tell you in their heart of hearts, Mike Harris and Ernie Eves, who were the last two conservatives to sit in the Premier's chair, they were not big on social conservative issues. They were about the economy. They wanted a conservative approach in Eves's case, maybe a more progressive conservative approach to handling the economy. And the social conservative issues, they, yes, they wanted the inside the tent, but they were not animated by that. Do you know whether Patrick Brown is animated by social conservative issues personally? I don't think he's animated by social conservatives. I think he's animated by the fact that hydro rates are through the roof. I think he's animated because of the fact that the economy is in, is in the tank. And I think those are the issues that Patrick, as leader, forget the fact that as an MP backbencher, he was dealing with party, uh, party uh, issues at that time. And again, people can judge him on that. But as leader of the party, he's focused almost squarely on the hydro rates and the economy. And I think that's what's going to drive people. Mm -hmm. Social issues are going to come up, and they should. But he he won't, he won't address them as fervent as he will uh, uh, economic issues. So I agree with John that it is a test of Patrick Brown's leadership. And so far, he gets uh, a middling grade on that because it's still a live issue. Let's look at how he's handled Monty McNaughton. He won the leadership in part thanks to Monty McNaughton, a social conservative who had a lot of the, of the pro-life support, dropping out of the race and delivering his support to him at the leadership convention. In the last few weeks, when there was another, yet another sex ed debate at the legislature, Monty McNaughton went out to address him. And Patrick Brown repudiated that, repudiated, repudiated that afterwards and said, I disagree, and that they would talk to Monty McNaughton about it. What happened? I don't know. What I do know is that the very day after Sam Oosterhoff won the nomination, who was there at his campaigning at his side? Monty McNaughton. So we'll see how he handles this. We'll see if he's able to to, to maneuver it in his best interest, but, but I'm not sure. Let's also be very clear. This is, we don't want to manufacture a narrative of what Patrick Brown's leadership may or may not look like come 2018 and what the caucus members will want to be fighting on. It should be about the fact that we're dealing with arguably the most politically corrupt government in, in Canadian history with the Liberals. It should be about that hydro rates are through the roof. It should be about the fact that the economy is not doing well. It should be about all these things. So I know that there are certain factions that are going to want to make it about social conservatism and want to scare people. But if Patrick ha is worth his salt as a leader, he will be able to fight back and, and just continue to talk about the economy period, and, and, and answer those questions from the media when, when the Toronto Star asks him, because they, they are the, gonna be the ones that ask him that, he has to just simply turn around and say, this is not, those are not the things that the, my, my leadership and my government's gonna deal with. We're gonna fix the economy, we're gonna deal with hydro rates. And when they period. ask, the, when they ask the, the follow up question, and the second follow up, and the third follow up you until they get an answer. The same thing, over and over again, well, Steve, because mm -hmm. this is also Patrick's challenge. Steve, Ontarians don't know him yet. So if he has that ability to continue to stick to a message and believe it, and as long as it's believable, then that starts seeping into the consciousness of Ontarians. Well, there's no shortage of issues for Patrick to deal with, notwithstanding yeah. some of these other ones. Quite frankly, even the one today, uh, you know, with respect to the Sudbury issue, all those issues are going to be, in fact, that they do dominates question period nowadays. Mm -hmm. So there's no shortage of issues. But the economy has always <clears throat> is something that I think Patrick will always be strong on, his caucus is strong on, and united on. And I think that's what he's going to focus on in the election. Now, of course, election's a, a year and some months away, but mm -hmm. um, but Patrick's pretty strong and pretty uh, pretty focused on that. I, 
I couldn't agree more with both of you. And by the way, Joe Warmington asked some pretty good questions as well <laughs> in, in your paper. Yes, Joe does. Yes, so it's he not does. just a star. <laughs> what I don't understand is how is how the Scarborough by-election unraveled like that, where yeah. Patrick Brown's office put out a letter, 10,000 or 13,000 copies of which said, I promise to scrap the sex ed curriculum. Martin, so, he, should be, he should be so lucky as to have it unravel and win. You know what I'm saying? Correct. That's right. Yes. It unraveled and, 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 and win by so much. That's it. right. Yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. Enough. Yeah. sure enough. Yeah. Sure enough. Let me put something else on the table here, which is that, and I guess this happens from time to time, but it's certainly happening a lot lately. Uh, Rick Dykstra is one. Paul Calandra is another. Joe Oliver, the former federal finance minister, is another. There are defeated Harper members of parliament who have now decided they miss politics. They may have uh, more that they want to contribute. And they are now looking at trying to win nominations for Patrick Brown's Ontario PC party. What, what do we really think about this, John? Well, you know, a lot of them are my friends, so I wish them well. But, you know, I think, I think having served in the Harper government for as many years as either Joe or Bob or others, Bob Decker's the other one who's Bob also Deckard, uh, Mississauga. Who's yeah. running for, for Mississauga and Paul. Um, you know, there's always a yearning for politics, and I think they see an opportunity with Patrick in a sense that they are Ontario MPs, we're Ontario MPs, and see an opportunity that they might be able to, to at least affect some change or do something and add some gravitas quite frankly, to Patrick's, uh, to Patrick's team. Is it the leader's so, interest, though, to have former Harper MPs running for him? It, it may or may not, but I think Patrick is allowing, much like he did with Sam and others, he's allowing them to run. And in some challenge, some writings, it'll be actually a challenge for some of the incumbent or, or the uh, mm -hmm. former MPs to win. And Paul Calandra's uh, writing, uh, people are talking about it being a, quite a bit of a challenge for, for Paul. It was still early, early days. No, but Joe Oliver, too, in your And opinion. Joe Oliver, too. And, and Bob's <laughs> face, they're all facing, uh, they're all facing uh, races and contestants. Uh, contestants. So it's not going to be easy for them. But I do think, though, if, if Patrick's going to be uh, true to his belief as he is with respect to allowing anybody to run and, and, and seek a nomination, then I think he'll allow them to run and see how it all falls out. What do you think? A double-edged sword. <clears throat> On the one mm -hmm. hand, they have high name recognition, mm -hmm. and that has helped uh, Patrick Brown in the Scarborough by-election when a municipal councillor with a high name recognition won. Uh, it will help him perhaps uh, do much better than in the past in Ottawa Vanier, where the former ombudsman, Andre Morin, is running. These are, these are almost household names. Joe Oliver is, is a bonus. Rick Dykstra, not so much. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the sort of opportunism of him running, not in his riding in St. Catharines, but next door in Niagara, uh, came back to haunt him. So it's a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword? Why would it be a double-edged sword to have a former finance minister of the government of Canada running as one of your candidates? Well, I think Joe Oliver will be a serious candidate, and I agree he brings gravitas to the job. Many people who voted against the Stephen Harper government will feel that it's another opportunity to vote against Stephen Harper's people and uh, in the next election when Patrick Brown doesn't necessarily want to be associated with the Harper government. Is it a problem, Adrian, when you are trying to sort of... I mean, Patrick Brown's 38. Mm -hmm. He's trying to present himself as kind of the new fresh face on the block and, and the choice of the next generation. And yeah. all of that. I sound like a Pepsi ad here, but, but <laughs> that's basically it. <laughs> But then you get, uh, you know, you get a former finance minister who's in his mid-70s, and you get some of these other MPs yeah. who've been around the block a couple of times. Is that problematic in terms of trying to present a fresh face to the no, people? No, I, I, here's why it's not problematic. Because it does, as John said, it, there's some gravitas to who, who the positions that many of them had. And for anybody who may have issue and may feel uncomfortable with a young leader, uh, such as Patrick, for whatever reason, you surround yourself by your uh, with, with with strength. Good, good to see a little gray hair good, out there. Maybe. Not not necessarily <laughs> yeah. a bad thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it, it is funny to hear all these names wanting to run again. I mean, it, once it's in your blood, I guess it's in your blood, and and you do miss it. But but there is still that hangover of the Harper government. Mm. But let's not forget, Patrick Brown was very much a part of that government mm. as well. Mm. And not, again, not so much. But, not but so he much. was there. <laughs> but he, he was, was there. there. He never made cabinet. <clears throat> I mean, you never really or heard a lot. Or chair of committee but, or parliamentary But he system. was still <laughs> part of the, the, the mm -hmm. Harper government for many years. And so I don't think it's going to matter as much come 2018 mm. for the next election. I think that there are going to be so many fights uh, on the floor of, of various nomination um, in battles across mm -hmm. the province. It's going to be fascinating. And I don't think a lot of those names you just mentioned may even be victorious. And, and Steve, I think, I think the election of Sam at 19 brings that age... It does bring the average age down. Yeah, so when you've got it's, it's worth... We should also point out... Uh, sorry, Martin, uh, yeah. right after this. You know, the, this has happened before. It went the other way uh, a decade ago when I think it was Tony Clement and John Baird and Jim Flaherty left provincial politics mm -hmm. in Ontario to run federally for Harper. Sure. Uh, two of them had just lost elections, I think. No, one of them. 
Clement had just lost an election, so it does work both ways. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And, and maybe Tony Clement will come back to Queen's Park again. Uh, that I doubt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say, I think you're, you're, my colleagues here are being generous, and I always am getting, being accused of ageism by picking on young Sam at 19 years old because he was homeschooled and so on. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say, Sam's a bit young. You were 30 when you ran. There's a big difference between 30 and 19, or even 22 when Patrick Brown ran for politics and 19 pre-university. And I think the former finance minister, with all due respect, will be 77 at the next election. Hmm. That's a little bit past the retirement age, and I have some good friends who are 75, 76, and they tell me they're getting tired when well, they still work. If you put them together, the average age is 45, which sounds about right. Which <laughs> well, is not a bad age. Not a bad age. <laughs> Let's try, uh, let me go to this other angle here. I, I was interested that after Patrick Brown first won the leadership, I think the first speech he gave was to a nurses' union. I think I remember that right. And he has tried outreach to a lot of the public sector unions, which is something that his predecessor, Tim Hudak, really didn't spend a heck of a lot of time on. I think Tim pretty much mm -hmm. wrote off the union vote, saying we're never going to get it, so I'm not going to waste my time. Brown has, I think, gone to Northern Ontario 25 times since becoming leader, and he has given numerous speeches to public sector unions, even though I think the Toronto Sun would say they're in the tank for the <laughs> win liberals. What do we think about the advisability of him spending his time that way? Well, I think it speaks to Patrick's you know, own admission about oh, sort of Big Kent Party. And I think that he uh, recognizes that there's no vote that shouldn't be at least uh, addressed or talked to with respect to, to, to conservative values and principles. Um, I remember when he ran, I was working for Christine Elliott at the time, but I remember when he ran for the leadership of the party and he was heading up north more times than we can imagine. We kept thinking, what the heck? There's only so many votes out there. But he ended up cleaning up in the north uh, with respect to the leadership that helped him win the, the leadership contest. So he is of the opinion that no matter where they are, no matter who you are, what you stand for, if you believe in conservative values and principles, quite frankly, and a lot of these union members, not so much even the leadership, but some of the members of these private sector unions are, are conservatives at heart. They believe in lower taxes. They believe in less government intervention. They believe in some of the things that Patrick and his government and his caucus have been talking about. Is he wasting his time going after no. union votes? No, no. it's because the Toronto Sun editorial <clears throat> board has enough common sense to recognize if you want to win an election, you need to get everybody on board and you actually need to have conversations with the unions, both public and private sector, in order to move uh, your agenda forward. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. My only sort of pause would be, what is it that he's promising them? What is it that he is saying to a public sector union, for example, in a private meeting, that when I become government, you know, a la Kathleen Wynne and a la Dalton McGuinty, they promised them the moon and did all sorts of things, but um, what are you prepared to put the taxpayers of Ontario on the hook for in order to get union support? But no, it's not a futile effort. It's an important thing to do, and I think for any conservative leader in any part of this country, you have to work with them. It's just, it's, you can no longer write them off anymore because their numbers are growing and they vote. And if in order for you to actually win certain ridings, you need some of those members on, on your side marking a ballot for you. A useful use of his time in your view, Martin? Before I answer that, I want to just say I think it's terrific that he's doing it. I really do. I'm not being coy here. I think Tim Hudak used to kind of dismiss the unions and call them union bosses. Every chance he got, he would say the union bosses, like your paper does, I think, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, well, sometimes, because uh, union bosses are often wrong. I think you make a, <laughs> the membership's okay. I think you're right that he is probably going to be what do what all politicians do and make some promises or imply, as he did with the doctors. I'm kind of interested in arbitration. Well, not quite promising it, but also reaching mm -hmm. out and telling them what they want to hear, I think is what yeah. he might be doing. But I think it's fabulous that he's reaching out to the police, the firefighters, public sector unions, and so on and uh, trying to be a big tent party. To your question, I think they might break his heart in the end, but that's okay. That's, you know, he's in business to represent all Ontarians and try to seek their support. So it's worth the effort. I think so. I, yeah. I think the Liberal Last government. Reason. I think the Liberal, liberal government has done more to, to damage some of the unions, both public sector and private Absolutely. sector, over the last little while than, yeah. than any other of the opposition parties. Okay, folks, that's our time. We just obviously should point out we didn't get into the whole Sudbury controversy today because that's going to be our story of the week on Friday. So uh, I thank you guys for avoiding it for now. We'll talk about it on the program on Friday. John Capibianco from Fleischman Hillard, Martin Redcon of the Toronto Star, Adrian Batchard of the Toronto Sun. Great to have all of you around our table tonight here at TVO. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.